This is the sixth session, the sixth session in our series on the early emperors. And today I'd like to talk about the birth of Christianity, which is an enormous subject. And to squeeze this into a single session is to do it serious disservice. There are many things that I will not say because I simply can't say them. However, let's press on as well as we can. And I start with this wonderful image from the great church or the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople or nowadays in Istanbul. A glorious piece of religious art or perhaps just a glorious piece of art. You see the virgin and child sitting in triumph and appearing to float in the sky. I did go into the great church some years ago and look up at this and it is undeniably one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. This is from the ninth century, long after the triumph of Christianity, and it is possible to see the triumph of Christianity as an inevitable progression in the ancient world. And I think that that will be the general theme of what I will talk about today. It does very much look as if the religious and philosophical thought of the ancient world was moving inevitably in the direction of Christianity. Having given that as the overall theme, let's have a look at the actual slides. Let's begin with ancient paganism. And here is a photograph I took some years ago. This is the seated Hermes, which may be a bronze of Lysippus himself, one of the great Greek artists. It was found in Herculaneum, cleaned up and put on display. And this is Hermes. This is one of the Greek gods. You could admire it as a work of art, and it does look very lifelike but it's not what we would regard as religious art. But let's talk about paganism. And again, let me begin with some reservations. I'm about to say things like, the chief characteristics of ancient paganism were that it was ethnocentric, ritualistic, and centered around inherited tradition. There is a very good case for saying these things, and I have indeed just said them. At the same time, these are only tendencies. It is not possible to look into the minds of all the people attending the various religious services held in the Greek city-states or in, in Rome or Italy, and to know what these people thought of the events in which they were participating, or what they thought of the gods that they were thereby honouring. For some people, the religions were indeed communal cults. There was no sense of a personal engagement with the divine. It was a matter of a contract made between your community and a supernatural being. The god would receive honour and sacrifices from your side, and you would receive benefits in war, or in agriculture, or in diplomacy, or in whatever, from the side of the god. It was a contract. I give to you, you give to me. Any sense of transcendence, any sense of a personal relationship with a divine being, would have struck people as very strange or perhaps not, perhaps for many people, there was a close personal relationship with the gods of the Greek and Roman pantheons. It's very difficult to say what most people believe. Indeed, it's very difficult to say what any one person believes. Somebody may believe something on Monday, but it may be something else on Friday or even Tuesday. But if you look back, so far as we can, at the various pagan religions, and notice the plural, there was no pagan religion. It was always a cluster of religions. If you look back at the pagan religions, they are overwhelmingly 
ethnocentric insofar as this is our God, not your God. Your gods are those ones over there. It is ritualistic. We discharge our duties to the God by following these particular rituals. And what we know about the God and what we know about the correct means of regarding the gods, we learn from inherited tradition, not from any body of revealed truth. And as I said, these religions are overwhelmingly communal. They have room for personal relationships, but they are, in all their outward manifestations, communal agreements. They are agreements between a political community and a particular god. And you can see this in the mythology, Aphrodite and Apollo during the Trojan War, they favour the Trojans. Diana, she is the patron goddess of Ephesus, as St Paul learns to his cost when he turns up. Athena, notoriously the patron goddess of Athens. The gods are immortal and powerful. They're not particularly just or loving. They are like us. They're better looking than we are. They live a great deal longer. They're cleverer. They have all sorts of magical powers that we don't possess. But there is, as I said, nothing particularly just or loving about them. There are scandalous stories regarding their dealings with each other. And their treatment of human beings is notoriously cruel and arbitrary. A question. If these gods were such dreadful creatures, why did their worshippers create them? You know, that's a good question. And I'm really ashamed to come back with the answer, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. It's an obvious question, I must confess. And I will think about an answer but I have none in my head at the moment. How on earth could people create such monstrous gods? The end of King Lear. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. The longer you look at the various pagan religions, the easier it is to understand how Christianity just rolled everything up in a matter of two or three centuries. Let's leave aside matters of religious truth. If you simply look at the psychology of it, Christianity has so much more to offer than the classical pagan cults. The real mystery is not, why did Christianity take over? The real mystery is, how did it take so long? But let's continue with the horrors of paganism. Here's a picture of Charon, the ferryman carrying souls across the river Styx. According to the established cults, and this may not have been in accord with what many or even most people believe, but according to the established theology of the ancient world, when you died, it didn't matter who you were, you might be an emperor, you might be a great general, you might be a peasant working in the fields, it doesn't matter who you are, you end up on the shore of the river Styx, waiting for the ferryman to come and to put you into his boat. You give him a coin, which had been put under your tongue when you were laid out, and if you didn't have the appropriate fee, you would have to wait on the far bank of the Styx for a hundred years, and then you'd be let across. But if you had the appropriate fee, you'd pay the ferryman. He would then take you across the river, and on the far bank, you entered the underworld, and there was no way back. You would then drink a cup from the river Lethe, according to some legends, which would strip you of all memory and all sense of personal identity, and you would spend eternity wandering around the underworld in a rather dim light, not having a particularly good or a bad time, an eternity of mediocrity. If you'd been particularly wicked, the gods might contrive to torture you forever and ever. If you'd been particularly good, or more likely for the pagans, if you just happened to be very well connected, 
you'd be allowed into the, the first class lounge of the underworld, which was the Elysian Fields, where you would have a thoroughly good time, but the Elysian Fields were not open to people of ordinary goodness. And that is the official view of the afterlife among the Greeks and the Romans. And I keep emphasising this may not have been the consensus view on the ground, but this is the official view, and it is therefore the view that was adopted by unknown but probably large numbers of people. In the 4th century BC, Plato had suggested a general remodelling of the established religions to bring in the idea of infinite punishments and infinite rewards in an afterlife. And he did this as a means of shoring up obedience in the totalitarian police state that he believed humanity needed and deserved. But to what extent Plato's recommendations were carried through, it is very difficult to say. There was a breakdown of these particular religions. There was a breakdown of these individual ethnocentric cults after the conquests of Alexander, because this for the first time brought large numbers of different peoples into the same political structure. It allowed people to move around and to learn from each other. Almost the first consequence of this mixing in the Hellenistic world, the world after Alexander the Great, was the growth of mystery religions. It may be that these maintain a great deal of continuity with what had happened before. It may be that even before the conquests of Alexander, your average Athenian believed much the same about an afterlife as the average person in modern England does. It may be that there is a great deal of continuity, it's just that this is not evidenced by the sources. But what we can say is that in the world created by Alexander in the eastern Mediterranean and the Near East, you have the immediate spread of non-Greek mystery religions. You've got Sibeli, you've got Mithras. You have the repurposing of Dionysus, who is in the Greek pantheon. But above all, you have the cult of Isis, an Egyptian divinity, the wife of Osiris, the guardian of souls in the underworld. There is a representation of her on the left, leading the favourite wife, I think, of Ramesses II into the underworld. And here on the right is a representation of a service in the Temple of Isis in Pompeii. Look at the picture on the right. Look at this representation of a service in the Temple of Isis. You can see certain similarities there, can't you? Then again, I suppose it's a religious ceremony, and there are always certain similarities. In the world that Alexander created, you have a breakdown of the official pagan cults. You have a movement away from these ethnocentric cults, Diana for the Ephesians, Athena for the Athenians, and you have the idea of personal conversion and personal choice and personal relationships with the gods. You have a movement away from ritualism. You must perform this sacrifice in this way at this time, and then the god will be pleased and will do the necessary favour. You have a movement away from that and towards belief in spiritual doctrines as evidenced in books. You have a movement away, to some degree, from inherited tradition towards revelation. You have a movement away from communal advantage. If we perform the appropriate sacrifices in the appropriate way, 
the gods will look kindly upon our community. That, of course, still continues right up until the establishment of Christianity and indeed beyond. But at the same time, you have the growth of the idea that a relationship with the gods will bring personal salvation. You have the repurposing of communal gods into personal saviours. This may have been a revolutionary transformation, or it may simply be that something which had always been there now comes into sight in our surviving sources. It is very difficult to say. It is certainly very difficult to speak with surety about these movements. The Roman supremacy and religion. The growth of Roman power throughout the Mediterranean world led occasionally to dreadful civil wars, but for the most part it ended wars and insecurity. The Romans stopped the Greek city-states from going to war with each other. The Romans stopped the Hellenistic kingdoms of Syria and Egypt from going to war with each other. The Romans put an end to piracy in the Mediterranean, and the Romans, for quite a long time, put an end to banditry on the roads. So far as was possible before the modern period, Rome put an end to war and insecurity in the Mediterranean world. It also created a vast open space within which people could move around as they pleased. The result was, for some people, to say, great, no more wars, a life of security so far as this can be achieved in my time, and so let us enjoy life as it is. One of the most popular philosophers in the early Roman imperial period was Epicurus, the, the Greek philosopher. Although Epicurus was not an atheist, he believed that the gods took no part in human affairs, he believed that there was no afterlife, and that so far as life had any purpose at all, then that purpose should be personal enjoyment. Not the pleasures of eating, drinking and sex, but the pleasures of friendship and quiet enjoyment. Fair enough. There were other people, however, who saw the establishment of peace based on the Roman conquest of the Mediterranean world as the prelude to a great religious change. And here you have Virgil writing in the first century BC. Now is come the last age of the Cumaean prophecy. The great cycle of periods is born anew. Now returns the maid, returns the reign of Saturn. Now from high heaven a new generation comes down. Yet do thou at that boy's birth, in whom the iron race shall begin to cease, and the golden to arise all over the world. Holy Lucina, be gracious. Now thine own Apollo reigns. Well, the whole of the fourth eclogue has been taken as a prophecy of the coming of Christ. Whether or not it is such a prophecy, we don't need to say. What is clear from this poem, however, is that there were people who believed that the establishment of the Augustan peace was the prelude to a new age of religious grace. That is it. They believed that the Augustan peace was the prelude to a new kind of society and a new relationship between mankind and the divine. We must hold that in mind, because now we move away from the Romans, we look at the Jews. This is rather controversial. It's something that I took from an Israeli newspaper. It is their religion, and so Jews in Israel can be taken as understanding what they believe now and what their ancestors believed in the distant past. But it does seem that for much of their history, for much of the time covered by the history books of the Old Testament, the Jews held the same view of the afterlife as the Greeks and the Romans, that everybody went to a netherworld called Sheol, 
a dark place in which shadow spirits called Rephaim dwelt. You can summon the spirits of the dead to answer questions, necromancy. Um, it's there in Samuel 28, verses 3 to 25. And the practice is forbidden in Leviticus 20, 27. The Jews appear to have regarded this fate, which is very similar to the fate of the Greek and Roman pagans, as final. For we must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. That last clause is ambiguous, but it is taken by my Israeli newspaper as evidence for non-belief in the kind of afterlife that we now take for granted. You then, however, have the Babylonian captivity and then the absorption of the Jews into the Hellenistic kingdoms. You have the disappearance of Jewish political autonomy and the movement of power within Jewish communities from secular rulers towards priests. And then in the revolt of Judas Maccabeus against the Greek rulers, you have the idea of Jewish martyrdom. These men have died in order to keep the Jewish people alive. And bearing in mind that there are these Jewish martyrs, is it entirely fair to regard them as just disembodied spirits flitting around on the far shores of some Jewish equivalent of the river Styx? Or do you, as you see in the book of Daniel, believe that, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt? What the writer in that Israeli newspaper, and I'm not simply basing this on him, this is um, something which you have seen in the literature for several centuries, starting in the 18th century with Bishop Warburton, but what my Israeli source is suggesting is that the Jews only begin to believe in a recognisable afterlife and a final judgment rather late in the history, not more than 200 years before the birth of Christ. But what is important is that the Jews come into the Augustan period with, for the most part, a settled belief in a final judgment and an afterlife. And here is a slide on the Jews and salvation. Here are the mainstream Jewish views on salvation, and there was no agreement. But I suppose you're dealing with Jews, and they never seem to agree with each other on anything. But there seem to have been three particular schools of belief, or perhaps three different tendencies towards belief among the Jews in the first century, either side of the birth of Christ. You have the Sadducees, they're the important people, the priestly class. They're the people who ran the temple. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believed that the covenant between God and the Jewish people simply applied to this life. Now, how you can believe that is your business, not mine. There's no doubt they did believe it. Just because it's rather hard for me to imagine means absolutely nothing. You then have the Pharisees, they get a rather bad press in the New Testament, but they believe in both an afterlife and a resurrection. You then have the Essenes, and they take a rather platonic view of the soul. They appear indeed to have been influenced at some level by Greek philosophy on this. They believe that after the death of the body, the soul would be released and those who are virtuous would enjoy a very pleasant, happy, happily ever after. So there are the Jews. The importance of the Jews, leave aside the birth of Christ at the moment, is that here is not a small sect. Here is a large community or a substantial set of communities 
in and around what we call the Holy Land, many of whom believe in a resurrection and a final judgment, which means that anyone among the Greeks and the Romans or the Syrians or the Egyptians who is inclined to desire a resurrection and an afterlife will in some sense be attracted towards the Jews. I'm asked to bear in mind the Egyptians as one of the sources for the tendency I'm describing alongside the Jews. That's true, and if you are a Christian or a Jew, you tend to take all this as having started with the Jews. God gave a revelation to the Jews, who then passed it on in various ways, or rather their revelation was then communicated to the Gentiles. But, of course, if you take a more archaeological view of it, if you look at the general history of the Near East, it may be that the Jews, during their time in Egypt, absorbed all of this, and that they're merely carriers of something which originated with the Egyptians. If you are a believer, either a Christian or a Jew, this is something that begins with the covenant that God made with Abraham and looking at the similarity between prayers written on Egyptian temple walls and prayers in the Old Testament can be rather embarrassing, but there does appear to be a certain Egyptian influence on the ancient Jews. The question then arises of when was this influence? Was it at the end of the Bronze Age? Or was it when large numbers of Jews settled in Alexandria in the 3rd century BC? And the answer comes back, I don't know. The Jews are there in the Eastern Mediterranean, and we can't say what all of the Jews believed, but there was a substantial number of Jews who believed in a resurrection, and a final judgment. They are there. They come into the empire after 60 BC. The Jewish areas are not conquered as such by Rome. They are absorbed, and the Romans prefer to rule the Jews indirectly through client kings. But as I said, I think last week, in 6 AD, one of the sons of Herod the Great was judged to be incompetent and so his part of his father's domain Judea was incorporated into the empire and attached as a semi-autonomous region of Syria under the rule of a Roman procurator and here we come into the political relationship between the Jews and the Romans the Jews wanted political independence they wanted a Jewish kingdom ruled by a Jewish king, which is, I suppose, not unreasonable as a desire, and they resented Roman imperial rule. Of course, there were many Jews who welcomed Roman rule because the deal that the Romans usually made with upper classes was, we will keep you in your positions. If you find that the ordinary people become too uppity, We'll send in a, a legion or a brigade of guards and put down these uppity people. So you will be secure in your wealth and your status. In return for that, keep the lid on things, keep the taxes coming in and make sure that we have no trouble. There were many people in the Jewish ruling class who thought that was a glorious deal. And so they were entirely happy with the idea of Roman government. It seems that once you get further down the scale into the Jewish common people, the Romans were not very popular, and that there were large numbers of Jews dreaming of independence. Indeed, there were many Jews at this period who dreamed not only of political independence, but of the Jewish Messiah, or the Promised One, who would redeem the Jews in some unagreed way. There were some who believed that the Jewish Messiah would 
conquer the world and rule the world in the interests of the Jewish people. There were some who believed that the Messiah would bring over other people towards Judaism. But whatever the case, there were many Jews who were, I shan't use the word infected, there were many Jews at this period who were inclined towards some kind of messianism, a belief that the Messiah was at hand and that a great change was about to take place and that this would be very much to the advantage of the Jewish people. Sadly, there were great changes at hand, but they turned out not to be to the great advantage of the Jewish people, but that's outside our scope for the moment. What matters is that although there were Jews dreaming of political independence and some kind of religious transformation of the world, the Romans had no intention of allowing this, and all of their interests were tied up in preventing any such thing from happening. Have a look at this map. On the left, the brownie areas, those of course are the areas governed by Rome, that is the Roman Empire. But have a look at the greeny area to the east. This is the Parthian Empire. It is a kind of middle zone all trade between the Mediterranean and China and India will pass at some point through the Parthian Empire. Parthia has a great deal of interest in expansion to the south and the east. At the same time, it dreams of an outlet on the Mediterranean. It is the successor of the Persian Empire of Darius the Great and Xerxes, and the Parthian kings would like an outlet on the Mediterranean, partly for reasons of prestige, but also because it would be commercially valuable rather than having to deal with Romans. Let us imagine that at some point around the birth of Christ, the Roman government had said to the Jews, all right, from now on, you can be absolutely independent. You can be sure that the Parthian envoys would have been immediately on the road to Jerusalem and that this independent Jewish kingdom would then have been some kind of football between the Romans and the Parthians. The Romans had no intention of allowing that to happen. Another point to look at is those yellow lines. Now they don't show exactly what I want them to show but what I am saying is that the road from Alexandria to Antioch runs through Judea. Judea may not be worth much in itself, but it is strategically vital. It's vital as a means of communicating between Egypt and the rest of the empire, the land communications, it is also of enormous strategic significance insofar as the Parthians want an outlet onto the Mediterranean, an independent Jewish state would be a tempting prize for the Parthians. And so every time the Jews begin to talk about political independence, the Romans grow nervous for the same reason Every time ordinary Jews begin to talk about political independence, the Jewish ruling class grows nervous. Because if this desire among the common people for political independence should boil over, then the Romans will intervene, and the nice cosy relationship in which the Jewish ruling class is protected in its status and property will be disrupted or even brought to an end. That is the background for the trial and execution of Christ. Leaving aside all religious considerations, the reason why the Sanhedrin was so nervous about Christ is that he was preaching to the common people. What he was preaching to the common people is not particularly important at the moment, what does matter about it, though, is that it is not particularly favourable to the Jewish ruling class, and it may not be favourable to the submission 
of these Jewish regions to Rome. Remember the story about how one of the Pharisees shows Christ a coin saying, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? This is an attempt at entrapment. If Christ says, no, it is not lawful because Caesar is an illegitimate ruler, he would have been arrested on the spot and bundled off before Pilate with half a dozen witnesses to testify to what he'd said. Instead, Christ comes out with a somewhat evasive answer, which may be taken as the foundation of much Western political philosophy. The Jewish ruling class is terrified of Christ, so far as he appears to have large sections of the Jewish people listening to him. They want him out of the way before things go too far. I don't know to what extent we can take the gospel records of his trial and execution at face value. They seem to treat Pilate rather gently, whereas he appears to have been an incompetent and brutal and rather corrupt ruler. It may well be that, for whatever reason, the Jewish ruling class went to Pilate, said, this man is stirring up trouble, you must get rid of him. And Pilate said, oh, I don't want any trouble myself. I, I don't want to get involved in this, thank you very much. And then the, the Jews lean on him saying, look, you don't, quite understand what is likely to happen if this man stays alive and then things move to their appointed end but whatever the case the Jewish ruling class does not like people like Christ and he's not the only one there's also John the Baptist of course but there are any number of other people whose names we don't even know rabble rousers people stirring up the common people to anti-Roman sentiments of various kinds, or people who simply may be stirring up the common people. The Jewish ruling class was nervous at this time, and bearing in mind the great disaster of the late 60s AD, you can understand that they could see that there was a great crash coming, and at the very least they wanted to put it off as long as possible. The importance of this, the historical importance of this, is that the Jewish ruling class persuaded the Romans to get rid of Christ. He was a nuisance to them. And after he was dead, the Jewish ruling class was also rather hostile to those of Christ's followers who continued to live and to operate in and around Judea. The significance of this? The significance is that Christ's surviving disciples find that their scope for making converts among the Jewish people is limited because as soon as anyone stands up and says, Jesus was the Messiah, then he's jumped upon, he's taken aside and stoned. Indeed, there was Saul of Damascus who was employed for some of his life to hunt out and to punish these troublemakers. The scope that Christ appears to have had himself for reaching out to the Jewish people as a whole is in some degree hampered by the continuing efforts of the Jewish ruling class after the crucifixion to suppress these dissidents, these heretics, these troublemakers, Therefore, if you want to spread the message of Jesus Christ, you need to look outside the Jewish people. Now, what was the Jewish approach to converting the Gentiles? And here again, you're dealing with groups of people who believe every conceivable position on a whole spectrum of views. Some Jews at this time and ever since have believed that Judaism is a religion for the Jewish people, as defined in some genetic or semi-genetic way, and that there should be no outreach. And in the New Testament times, Herod and his family were not seen as Jews, and the Samaritans, everyone else saw them as Jews, but the Jews didn't see them as Jews. There were some very particularistic, some very ethnocentric Jews who believed that their religion was for themselves and not for other people. On the other hand, there were many other Jews, 
some of them were willing to go looking for converts and some of them, probably a larger number, were passively willing to accept converts. It seems, for example, that the synagogues throughout the Eastern Empire were open to Gentiles to come in and join in the worship, and that those Gentiles who were particularly interested were able to become Jews. However, the Jews themselves insisted, as they still do, that if you want to become Jewish, you've got to adopt the whole body of Jewish law, which for men involves circumcision. As I said after the crucifixion, the scope for spreading the word of Christ among the Jews is hampered by a continuing persecution. And so if you want to spread the word, it must inevitably be outside the Jewish communities. This is the significance of St. Paul, and I was discussing this with one of my students in the Greek New Testament class that I run before this session. He pointed me to a number of texts in the New Testament in which Christ was suggesting an outreach to the Gentiles. He was willing to accept non-Jews, and there, there is talk in the early chapters of Acts about an outreach to the Gentiles. To say that St. Paul was, was responsible for this is an exaggeration. At the same time, St. Paul is one of the great creative geniuses of history. He did not simply have the idea that Christianity was for all peoples. He seems to have had a positive desire to bring in as many Gentiles as possible. He went on a series of tours of the Roman East, preaching, of course, in the synagogues and winning some converts among the Jews, but much more often than that, preaching to what may have been vast crowds of Gentiles. Whenever he turned up in Jerusalem, it would be with another 10 or 20,000 or perhaps another 50,000, we don't have figures, but immense numbers of Greek-speaking converts. And this causes a difficulty, an obvious difficulty. And here are the relevant verses from Acts chapter 15. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. There it is, that last clause, but that we write unto them, the Gentiles, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And that is it. The early Christians, the surviving apostles of Christ, agreed to drop all requirements of circumcision or any conformity to Jewish law. If you became a Christian, it was no longer necessary to become a Jew first and then to accept that Christ had been the Messiah of the Jews. You now became a Christian directly and your only requirements were that you should abstain from pollutions of idols, that is, you should no longer take part in any pagan religious ceremonies, that you should, well, that you should clean up your private life, 
And then you have the two further requirements, which were soon forgotten, to abstain from things strangled and from blood. And that was it. And so at this council in Jerusalem, around 50, the apostles agreed that they would no longer require conversion to the Jewish faith before you could become a Christian. And the path was cleared for St. Paul to start, or St. Paul to continue bringing in unknown multitudes of Greek-speaking non-Jews to the faith. It is at this point that Christianity either ceased or began to cease its early existence as a Jewish heresy, and it jumped into the mainstream Gentile population. You then have, in AD 70, the destruction of Jewish autonomy and the destruction of Jerusalem itself, and a final parting of the ways between the Jews and the early Christians. And that's it. During the next three centuries, Christianity as embraced by increasing numbers of Greeks, and particularly of Greek intellectuals, outclasses the contemporary pagans in literary and philosophical output. The church grows as a closely linked network of communities throughout the empire. It is possible to say that it's only a matter of time before some emperor comes along and realizes that Christianity is the only option for an imperial faith. It has everything to offer. It has philosophical and literary brilliance. It has a solid belief in a resurrection and a final judgment. It is everything that a government could ever want if it wants a faith to unify the Mediterranean world. It doesn't quite work out that way, but it is, it is a very tempting faith. And this brings us, ah yes, the matter of Christianity in Pompeii. found this a year ago when I was putting together some slides on Roman inscriptions. Has anyone seen these Rotas Sator squares? These are found all over the Mediterranean world. Nobody is entirely sure what they are. They have been taken since the Middle Ages as a cryptic symbol of the early church, that if you're a Christian and you don't wish to advertise the fact too closely to outsiders, you put up one of these symbols, you put up one of these inscriptions outside your front door and other Christians will be aware that you are one of the faith. We don't know for sure, but somebody about a hundred years ago took these Rotas squares as a kind of Scrabble puzzle. You can take all of these letters apart as an anagram and reconstitute them into a cross. Paternoster from top to bottom, Paternoster from left to right, and, well, the Latin equivalents of Alpha and Omega, Omega and Alpha, around them. I'm told that the probability that this is not what the uncovered anagram says it is, is very, very small. It is almost certainly what you see. Assuming that this is a Christian symbol, here is a Rotas Sator inscription on a bathhouse wall in Pompeii. We know that Pompeii was destroyed in August or October 79 AD. That is 46 years after the crucifixion. It's seven years after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The mainstream view of Christianity is that until sometime after 100 AD, Christianity is an overwhelmingly Eastern religion and it is evidenced in Rome and in some of the larger Western cities, but it is a faith of the Greeks and that those Latin speakers who become Christians are expected to learn Greek. Whereas here in a very small and provincial Italian town before 79 AD, you may have evidence for the existence of a Christian community 
And if that is so, it does require us to reconsider our history of the early church, but I can't say more than that. Oh, there are the journeys of St. Paul through the eastern Mediterranean. There is a nice 5th century fresco of St. Paul from the cave of St. Paul in Ephesus. Very fine image. Now, persecution. Top right, there's a nice quote from Gibbon, chapter 2. The various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. As with Gibbon, there's always a large degree of truth in what he says. Indeed, if I'd quoted more than that, I could have gone on to say, and religious tolerance promoted religious concord, which is not entirely correct. But this is a fairly accurate description of the religious policies of the early emperors. The Romans were not enormously interested in persuading people into or out of any particular religion. The Christians were a little different. It is not the case that the Christians were, on principle, disloyal subjects of the emperor. Look at St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. That is a fairly strong endorsement of loyalty to the Roman state. However, the problem was that Christians were not allowed to take part in pagan sacrifices. That meant that Christians were not able to join in the perhaps entirely ritualistic sacrifices to the divinity of the empire. There is also the fact that the Christians, as a network spanning the entire empire of large or of growing communities, could be considered to be a state within a state, a rival source of authority to that of the imperial state. Even with the best of intentions, the early church and the Roman state were unlikely to find themselves in complete agreement. And there is evidence, almost from the beginning, of persecution by the Roman state. Here is Suetonius' Life of Claudius, that is before 54 AD. Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christus, he expelled them from Rome. What that means is a matter of some controversy, for obvious reasons. Or Suetonius, in his life of Nero, punishment was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new and mischievous superstition. We then have quite a long passage from Tacitus. There was the great fire of Rome during the reign of Nero, there were rumours circulating almost at once that Nero himself had started the fire. Nero appears to have tried deflecting blame from himself by saying the Christians did it. And so the Christians in Rome were arrested and many of them were put to death in a number of unpleasant ways. This does not mean that Nero made a series of general laws against the Christians which were strictly enforced during and after his reign. The first serious anti-Christian laws were made by Domitian and these were very laxly, very half-heartedly, very unenthusiastically enforced for the most part during the next 250 years. It is not the case that right up until the conversion of Constantine, uh, the average Christian was permanently in fear of arrest and torture and death. It seems that for entire generations the church was left in peace and that for much of the time the church and the Roman state 
quietly cooperated. But here is a representation of the torments that Nero inflicted on the Christians after blaming them for the fire of Rome. He had a number of Christians rounded up, wrapped in cloths, soaked in pitch, tied up and set fire to, to use as illuminations for his garden parties. This is perhaps a rather overdone 19th century representation. You can see lots of naked flesh. You can see the usual corruption of the Roman upper classes. And in the middle of it, you can see a rather stout and unpleasant looking Nero. Although you can pick holes in this, there is no reasonable doubt that something like this did take place. And again, here is the Christian martyr's last prayer by Jean-Léon Jérôme, around 1870. Again, you can pick holes in this. This is supposed to be the Colosseum, but it also looks like the Circus Maximus. And there is the Temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill behind it, which means that it's unlikely to be the Colosseum. It doesn't matter. It is a generic representation of the persecution of the Christians. You can see those ghastly crucifixions and fires all around. And you see the calm Christians praying and waiting for the end. You see a rather hungry lion coming through that trap door, another lion behind, and a tiger as well, and a vast crowd of people who will enjoy watching these people torn to pieces and eaten by the wild animals. Again, this is not a serious danger that most Christians ran be between the crucifixion and the conversion of Constantine. But there is no doubt that something like this did happen every so often. One of the reasons why the Roman Empire continues to be so interesting for us is that it is within the Roman Empire that Christ was born and preached and was crucified, and it is within the Roman Empire that the Christian Church first emerged, and the Christian faith is touched at almost every point by aspects of the Roman imperial state and the various civilizations of the Roman world. It may indeed be that the most important event of the first century was not the rather photogenic excesses of Caligula or Nero, or Claudius' invasion of Britain, by far the most important event of the first century of the Roman Empire, the most important effect of the Augustan settlement, was the emergence of the Christian Church, something that is still with us today, and will, I have no doubt, be with us for a very long time to come. So that's all I have to say at the moment, and we actually have some time for questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question, I'll do my best to answer it or to start a discussion. A question about the authority of the Roman state to declare people as gods and what this meant. The Senate claimed that it had the authority to add gods to the official pantheon. Normally this was exercised to incorporate some new Eastern cult, like the cult of Sibeli, for example. But it also extended to putting human beings into the pantheon. This had been done, apparently, with Romulus, the founder of Rome, though he was also the son of a god. It was also done for Julius Caesar, and after his death it was done to Augustus. What did it mean? For some people, it meant absolutely nothing. It meant the same as putting up a statue in Parliament Square. For some people, it meant that Augustus had become a god, someone to whom you could pray it with the same expectation of delivery as when you prayed to Apollo or Jupiter himself. And for some people, it was simply 
another reason to sacrifice. So what it meant is very hard to say. It depends who you were. No doubt some people did believe as passionately in the divinity of Augustus as some people do and have believed in the divinity of Christ. How many people believed that and of what kind those people were, I can't say. You see, there are so many things we don't know. It's not like uh, looking at the history of 18th century England where it is possible to answer questions with a high degree of certainty. You can even use things like election returns and newspaper readership in the 18th century to construct something approaching opinion polls. But once you go back further and once you get into the first century of the Roman Empire, there are mysteries upon mysteries. So the Senate had the legal authority to make people into gods and to demote them from gods. To what extent people believed that this had an actual religious significance, I can't say. A supplemental question about belief in and the nature of an afterlife. It's a good question. If you don't believe in an afterlife, why bother believing in gods? They don't have that much to offer, except maybe victory in battle in this life. I suppose that's something. We have been conditioned, whether or not we're believers or atheists, to think of religion as a set of mutual promises. You keep your nose clean and you will look forward to an infinity of bliss or something like that. For the ancients, it was all rather bleak. You didn't get much out of it. The gods got a bit of entertainment. We got to wander around with someone's head on a pole now and again, and that was it. If you make any statements about the beliefs of the Roman upper class in the first century, you're basing your claims on very slender evidence. But it does seem that there was not much in the way of strong religious belief in the Roman upper class in this period. Tiberius, for example, was, as far as anyone can tell, an atheist, but he still believed in astrology and he still believed in fate. Well, fate and astrology are the same thing. So what did the Romans believe? They believed even those who were atheists appear to have believed in astrology. They also believed in portents and omens and, and they believed that there was some kind of shadow existence after death. Mapping the contours of the Roman upper class mind is very difficult at a remove of 2,000 years and working out what anyone else believed is beyond me. It's only when you get to it's only when you get to the Christians that you can say, ah, here is someone who believes X because, well, because there has been continuity and at least we understand what these people are saying. Whereas the pagans, I'm never sure what they believed, if they believed anything at all. And of course, if you believe something on Monday, it may not be the same as you believe on Friday, or even Tuesday. Those were religions. We know relatively little about them because they were in competition with Christianity, and they lost that competition, and they were then flattened. We're left trying to work out what their believers believed. But um, let me come on to that because we're all asking, we're all discussing the religious geography of the ancient world. So let, let's have a look at some pictures as we discuss it. Question, were there any other religious groups persecuted as the Christians were? Yes, the Druids. The Romans were rather tolerant. There was the religion of Sibeli, a goddess from Phrygia in modern Turkey. The Romans brought her cult to Rome during, I think, the First Punic War. They were told she will be favourable to the Roman state. The Senate then welcomed the goddess into the city and then realised to its consternation that the priests of Sibeli were supposed to castrate themselves and so almost at once a law was made saying that no Roman citizen could possibly become a priest of this deity. But the Senate never tried to suppress the cult of Sibeli. The only 
religions the Roman state made serious efforts to suppress were Druidism, and that was because the Druids had the charming habit of roasting Roman prisoners of war to death in baskets. And, of course, Christianity, because the Christians would not join in the worship of the emperor. The Jews, they wouldn't join in the worship of the emperor either. But the Jews had the excuse of being an ancient people with a pre-existing disinclination to join in other people's religious ceremonies. The Romans could live with that. They could give a dispensation to the Jews. They took a different view of the Christians because the Christians were, for the most part, renegades. They were dropouts from Greek and Roman society. So these people had been born into particular duties and they were trying to cast them off under colour of religious prejudice. So Druidism and Christianity. A series of questions about what the early Christians believed and what they offered to converts. There's Matthew chapter 16, I think, where Christ is asking, so who am I? And Peter jumps in with, you are the son of God, are you not? And that's when Christ answers, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, etc. So it is there in the Gospels. Not that Christ is a God, but that he is the only begotten Son of God, or that his substance is the same as that of God, that in some respect that has been clarified by the seven ecumenical councils, God and Jesus are one and the same. They don't ask me to explain what those clarifications are. A question about Christianity and the divine right of kings. It is partly that. I think the divine rights of kings is something that emerges towards the end of the 16th century, and it is a big thing, particularly in England, right the way through the 17th century. It's largely based, I think, on Romans chapter 13, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Certainly the Church of England in the 1670s and 80s made a great fuss about Romans, saying that Paul was preaching obedience even to Nero. Therefore, what was the fuss that dissenting Protestants had with James II? Of course, as soon as James II began to deprive good Anglicans of their livings and their positions in the universities, they very quickly found that there were limitations in Romans. But Right up until the second part of 1688, the Anglican Church was insisting that Romans chapter 13 was an absolute and unconditional endorsement of the divine right of kings. After that, they changed their minds, and then once James was safely out of the country, they decided that it probably did mean what they'd previously said, and those wicked Whigs were keeping the king out from his own. That's a different story, isn't it? I've got to run because I've an emergency Latin class where somebody else can't teach. Was that all right as an introduction? As an historical introduction to Christianity, I've tried to avoid saying anything definite one way or the other about the theological claims, but to treat it as an historical phenomenon. Does it work as that? Yes. Okay, well... Thank you. I will send you those slides, and I'll send you last week's as well. It's a, it's a matter of seconds for me to convert them to PDF and send them, but, well, I've got another lesson now, and then I've got another lesson, and another lesson, and I'm back to back until 10 o'clock this evening, and so I'll try to do it today, but I will do it at some point. Okay, I'll let you go, but I'll see you all next week, and have a good yes. weekend. Yes.